I'm the designer of this language called Elm, and we're going to be talking a bit about Elm, but the, the real focus of this talk is learning about functional reactive programming as a concept that can be applied in JavaScript or on server side. Um, so the hope is to get these, make these ideas clear such that they can be used in any context. Um, so uh, to sort of contextualize where we want to go with this, I have a couple examples set up to sort of see what we can do with this style of programming. So the first one is a little uh, Mario example where I have him jump. And sometimes he can double jump. So this is a bug. So it'd be nice if we could go back in time and figure out what happened exactly at that point in time. Um, it's a little hard to see what's going on here. So you can actually turn on a trace of him. Uh-oh. So now is, oh no, I turned off hot swapping. <laughs> so now as you go through the program, you can see Mario's path through space. And then rewind through that. So uh, kind of we're, we're giving ourselves the tools to sort of work with time in a much more expressive way. And this isn't just for games. You can do this kind of stuff uh, for kind of interactive diagrams or more traditional websites. So this is like a library catalog with a live search feature. So if I want the standard libraries, I can filter down really quickly. And if I'm curious about a function called map, I can find all of the relevant uh, functions. Or I see this weird symbol. I'm like, oh, what is that? Um, and so this is all happening with this functional reactive style that makes it quite easy to make this kind of application. So to understand exactly what's going on with functional reactive programming, first we're going to start with functional graphics. How do we render things in a way that uh, doesn't require mutation and state? Um, second, what is reactive programming? How can we interact with the world in a way that is still uh, in a functional style? From there, we'll start to write some short code, like how, how does this actually look when we put in practice? And finally, we'll see how this integrates with JavaScript. So for this to really be practical in the world, you have to be able to work with the world. Um, so first, we have functional graphics. So the goal, this was really the original goal when I started working on this language, was how do you make graphics simple and declarative? And when you're working with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, you have this, uh, you run into these problems that Maybe, maybe shouldn't be problems. So like, say you're working on centering something, like an image. And you're like, OK, I would like this to be centered in the middle of the page, both vertically and horizontally. And like, the, the, the kinds of acrobatics you need to do to get that to happen uh, can be really frustrating. So that's sort of what motivated this. And what we did in Elm was break graphics up into three separate parts. Um, so first is text and links. So this is just a framework for working with words. And when you think of uh, Microsoft Word or uh, Markdown or LaTeX or HTML, all of them struggle with certain kinds of positioning because text itself is about fitting into a container, not putting containers together. Um, so on top of that, we have a way to talk about layout. So we can talk about text, and then we have a way to compose rectangles that's quite nice. And finally, we have freeform graphics. Um, and so by separating these into three separate categories, um, we're able to have much nicer experience working with, all, with each of them. So as an example of this, oops, um, we'll write a little bit of code. So uh, so this is an example of showing an image. Um, and main is what gets shown on screen. So this is an element, a rectangular thing. Um, and we're saying it has a width of 100, height of 100. Um, so we can name this Yogi and add another thing. So maybe we want, uh, maybe we want to show some text. So in Elm, you can say plain text, hello and see this on screen. So maybe we have some words. 
And again, this is an element, some rectangular thing. Oops. And finally, we actually have special support for Markdown. So you can make a block of Markdown and say, uh, I don't know why you would say that. Well, Yogi might say that. Um, oops. So now we have a bunch of sort of primitive, uh, oops, primitive elements. Um, and it's kind of boring. You don't want an application that's just an image. You want something that has a bunch of things. So when we want to create a stack of things where it's marked down. We're able to just say, I want these to flow down. Let's get rid of the picnic. And if I want it to flow to the right or left or up or inward, outward, that's more fun. So you can compose things in a nice way. And I started out by saying, why is vertically, cent vertically centering things hard? In Elm, you say, I want a container that's 200 by 200 in the middle. I'd like there to be Yogi. So vertically centering, these kinds of positioning things become quite easy when your framework just talks about those, those tasks. So that's all fine and good, but not everything is a rectangle. You can't express everything you want in that world. So we also have a way to make a collage of different shapes. So let's make a collage that's 200 by 200. And in the middle, I'll say I want a filled red circle that's got a radius of 50. Cool, that's a little bit too big for the screen. I feel very loud now that the air conditioner went off. Um, or we can say I want a outlined solid blue rectangle that's 60 by 60. Or I can say dotted or dashed. But we have this very declarative way of saying I want to make these shapes. Um, we're, we're sort of at the very minimal way of describing the scene, a filled red circle, an outlined uh, blue rectangle. So what's cool about this is uh, this is an uh, element just like anything else. So it's a rectangle that can fit into some flow or container. But there's a nice part about it, which is that you can put elements within it in a freeform way. So if I want to have some plain text, I can just add that in there. Now, what's nice, what's nice here is that any of these things I can start to rotate. So if I want to rotate uh, by, oops, by 30 degrees, my square that's falling off the screen now, or my text, Or if I want to scale things, it's going to be pretty big. Uh, we have freedom over sort of where these things are positioned on screen, and we can work with them in a really flexible way. And so we have a world for working with rectangles that's nice and well behaved. We have a world for working with shapes that gives you the freedom you want. Now, this is kind of where I got with Helm uh, at first, where I was like, OK, cool. Like, I can draw pictures on screen. There's Yogi Bear. This is great. Um, and then I was like, OK, but I want to make like a website or a game or something. And the key problem with all these things is that they don't move. Right? This is not a very interactive uh, experience. So I came to this point where I was like, what do I need to do to keep this nice, pure model of graphics and start to have interactivity? So that brings us to reactive programming. And you can think of this as control flow for events. So there was a day when people didn't use for, for loops and if statements. This is sort of the same kind of thing, but for events. Um, so we've got 
uh, a user interface that we want to present to people, and they're going to be giving us events from keyboard and mouse, um, and we want to be reacting to them, giving them like new results, new screens to, to look at. So an Elm program is kind of broken up into these, uh, or a reactive programming sort of works in this model uh, with three parts. First, you have an input, which is something from the world. Second, you have a way to transform that input. So if you have the mouse come in, you want to transform it to some other kind of value. And finally, we have a way to update state. So you must have state in your application to be able to have a like experience that's, I mean, got state. I mean, like any, any, any app you use online is going to have some state. Um, so, so what does this look like in reactive programming? So the whole sort of idea is built on this, uh, this concept of a signal. So uh, this, I hope you're somewhat familiar with a type signature. So this is, this is a value called mouse.position. And its type is not just a pair of integers, but a signal of pair of integers. So it's a pair of integers that's changing over time. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is a good way to think of it. Signals are a value that changes over time. And I think the best way to understand this is to actually see it in action. So, oops. So we can say main equals, oh, one quick note. As text, we'll take anything and show it on screen. So if we say this, we get to see it on screen. So lift as text onto mouse.position. OK, so as I move my mouse around, uh, the view updates automatically. And so lift is kind of doing some tricks here, but the idea is this signal, its current value is just what it, like the meaning of mouse position is the current value right now. Um, so another example of this might be import uh, keyboard, and we can say keyboard.arrows. So as of right now, I'm not pressing anything, but as I press up, we see why it goes up, down, left, right, all sorts of things. And it's representing what is the state of the world right this second. So these are kind of our inputs from the world. Next, we have a way to transform them, right? So it wouldn't be fun if our programs just were coordinates and an x, y. Um, so we have this function lift. And if you've seen a map on lists, this should look very familiar. We're taking each value that's coming in on the signal, and we're transforming it with some function. So the first argument is saying, take some a and give me back a b. The second thing is we have a signal of A's coming in. And last, we have a signal of B's coming out. So we can transform it. So when we look at this example with our mouse.position, what we're saying with the lift is as the signal changes, show it as text. So this is kind of the, the most boring example of uh, a signal. So let's try to make this example more exciting. So we have this sort of declarative way of describing our scene. So what we can do is say, okay, let's say this is a scene uh, that takes in a pair of integers and gives back an element. So I'll have an X and a Y. Now, with my main, I can say, I want the scene to be 100, 200, or sorry, 400. Uh, so these values will just get passed in. We're not using them, though. So let's say to float x over 100. And as I change the x, you'll see it changes size. And let's say I rotate the words by uh, float y. Oh. So you can see some rotation there. Now, what's cool is you're able to just say, OK, I want to lift this onto something that's changing over time. So 
So as I move the mouse around, we see all of these things uh, sort of just, just reacting. Um, and what's great about this approach is the, you have this very declarative way of saying, here's how I specify my scene, whether that's uh, text and layout or whether it's something very, very freeform. Um, and adding interactivity that, to that is really, really easy. So I was also very excited when I got this program working. There, there's like perpetually like programs like this where I want to like, I'll, I'll like call my family and be like, guys, look at this. And they're like, it's just Yogi. And I'm like, or like, oh, look, hello is spinning. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna see how to make bigger, bigger things with this. Um, so, uh, so that was Lyft. Um, so Lyft 2 is the like, next variation of this. Uh, there are many programs that have more than one input. We just used mouse, but what if someone wants to use mouse and keyboard, right? So far we're in trouble. Uh, but this function, it's the same kind of thing, but we're taking both an A and a B and giving back some transformed C. So we can combine two signals and get out uh, a new result. So this means we can have something that depends on both. Uh, uh, I, I could add it to this example, but just imagine uh, we take two arguments here and both the mouse and the keyboard are messing with our scene. So, oops. So there are lots more of these. There, there are many lifts. There's lifts up until eight, and then at that point, you should stop lifting. That's too, that's too much. Um, there's actually a way to go higher, but like really that's a lot, something's going weird. Um, okay, so this is good. We have things that will react to us, but we don't have any way to remember what's happened. Like we know where the mouse is now, but we don't know where the mouse was one frame ago. So that brings us to our way to update state. So I think the best way to understand this is if, if you've seen some functional programming languages, you'll have seen uh, fold, fold. So this is fold L. That stands for fold from the left. You have a list of things, and I'm, I'm going to do it so it's right for you guys. Uh, you fold, and you go across the, from the left. And then you have fold from the right, and you're accumulating values this way as you traverse it. So we have fold P. Uh, this is fold from the past. So as events come in, uh, we are going to be accumulating them. And so what's happening here is uh, updates are going to be coming in on our signal. And our first function here is saying, take whatever value comes in, take the current state, and give us a new state. Um, and we just start it with, it with this initial state B. Um, so I think uh, we'll see. Uh, let's do an example of this. So... So instead of mouse position, let's use clicks. And we'll keep the lift, but we'll say fold P. I'm going to get in a click. And I'm going to have a counter. And I'm going to say counter plus 1. And my initial state of the counter is 0. And I, ah, yes. OK, so as I click, it's counting up. And so what that means is, as clicks come in, I'm going to start with my initial state 0. And when a new event comes, I'm going to increment the counter by 1. So this is the bare minimum simple example. But you can imagine uh, as the mouse moves or as keyboards are moving, as time passes, you can be accumulating some state as you go through the program. So. Together, this gives us a, a sort of comprehensive way to say, take this input from the user, transform it in some way, update our state, and then show something back on screen. So we have the raw materials to make uh, a proper application. Um, and so I should mention, this is a very nice paper, the original one on this general topic. It's a fun one. It's kind of out of date, but it's a good read if you're interested. Um, there was a brief time where I thought I invented this. So like, I got to that point where everything was static. And I was like, oh, well, what if there were values that changed over time? And I was just like, wow, this is going to change everything. And then found out that like, someone published a paper on it 14 years earlier. So uh, definitely do a literature review when you think you have a cool idea. 
Um, so, uh, so, so now that we have this concept of, of functional graphics, a way to do reactive programming that keeps that purity, how, how do we actually do stuff? And so what's been interesting working on Elm is that the first thing that was uh, really easy was games. So like the, the first thing that, that I ended up writing and a lot of Elm users ended up writing was games. And it's kind of weird because games feel very difficult, but they actually lend themselves very nicely to this sort of freeform graphics uh, basic, you're, you're handling mouse and keyboard at a very uh, low level. Um, from there, uh, we started working on diagrams and making it nice to present things. And finally, like proper web apps where you can uh, sort of have an interactive experience. So the goal is to cover sort of interactive graphics stuff. Um, and so we're going to focus on games because it's a fun example. Um, but the lessons and this one can be applied to any of the other domains. And there's lots of examples for, for, for each of them. So, um, cool. So here I have sort of a basic Mario program, but I've taken out all the interesting parts. Um, so we start with a model of Mario. He has a position, an x and a y, and a velocity, vx and vy. And that's what it means to be Mario. He doesn't have feelings. He just has physical attributes. Um, <laughs> so, and we also have a render function. These, this is kind of building on what we saw uh, so far. So we have a collage, which lets us do the freeform stuff. And I have a rectangle that's filled with this color. That's the sky. I have a rectangle that's filled with this green color and positioned at the bottom. And finally, I have Mario, um, who's moved to wherever Mario happens to be. Now, the key interesting part is uh, our input. So right now, we have constant Mario. So Mario doesn't move at all. He's the most boring Mario. Um, and uh, we want to interact with him. So the first thing we really need is more interesting input. Right now, we just have a picture of Mario, which <laughs> Yeah, there's there's merit to that, um, but we can do we can do better. So let's create an input uh, that's keyboard dot arrows. So this is one we saw before, but I'll just show it again so we remember. And the double dash is a comment, so that's that's going away. So up, down, left, right, we can see what things are doing right now. Um, so what we want to do is make Mario depend on what has happened so far. So we want to use this fold P again. Um, so we're going to step Mario forward based on our input. So things are coming in as input. We're taking Mario as our initial state. And then we're using the step function to say, OK, the input changed like this. We have Mario. What's the new Mario? Um, so right now, uh, our step function is is very boring. It's like, OK, take the input, throw it away, and give back Mario like he was originally. So, so we can do better than this. We now have some directions um, to modify Mario with. So let's make a little function. Uh, ah, no, 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 no. Oh, crap. OK. Ah, I need to rewind this example by a little bit. Um, so instead of this input being keyboard arrows, let's look at uh, FPS of 40. The problem of live coding. So now I change a couple of things. We're looking at an input, and it's this signal frame per second of 40. And we're just showing that on screen. So you can see it kind of jittering around. And this is giving the time delta between each frame. And uh, I can't, if one were to divide 1,000 by 40 in their head, it'd probably be between 26 and 27. So we're getting these frames that are trying to shoot for 40 frames per second. Now, we can use time as an input to our program. So when I step Mario forward, I can say, OK, I have this time delta. Uh, that I can use. So 
first thing we can do to, to Mario is add some physics, right? So if he has a velocity, he should move in the world. So let's take a time and a Mario. And we want to say, I want a new Mario where his x becomes Mario.x plus Mario dot the x times t, right? So we take our time delta and his velocity, put them together to figure out how far he's moved. We also say this for y's, Mario dot ui times t. So a key thing to do is apply your functions, not just write them. OK, so Mario still doesn't move. Does anyone see why he doesn't move? Because his velocity is 0. He's got a boring velocity. So let's, OK. <laughs> it works. It works great. OK, so now we have like Space Jump Mario on a planet with no gravity. And he's just like going for it. So this is good. This is a good start. Um, but we're missing some key things. So uh, one thing we're missing is keyboard, uh, keyboard input, because I took it out. But we're missing it now. Um, so we can, sort of, we can augment our input. We don't just care about time, but we also care about what the keyboard is doing. So in this case, we can take uh, lift two. OK, um, and also keyboard.arrows. OK, so let's look at what this value is like. So it's a little harder to see. Um, so this notation here is a little odd, but it's basically saying this is a function that takes two things and makes a pair out of them. Um, and so we're pairing up the time deltas that are jittering around like before, and also our inputs from the world. So both of these things we're going to use as our input to Mario. So now we don't just have uh, time delta here. We also have directions. So uh, let's give him a more boring vo y velocity. So we have directions now, but we're not using them. So let's make a little walk function. So if, uh, actually, let's say we want a new Mario where his vx becomes direction dot x, and we need to convert it to float. Apply it. So let's see. OK. We are changing his velocity. His velocity is a little bit high. So let's try to divide this by 10. That's better. Perfect. OK, so we have Mario, but he can't jump, right? So this is a key feature of Mario. Imagine playing, and the Goombas are coming along, and you're just like, uh, it's not going to be a very, very uh, long game. Um, so we need a way to jump. So again, we can work with our directions and say, I want a new Mario where his VY is updated. Well, OK, I got ahead of myself. Uh, we don't always want to jump. Like if he jumps negative, like we don't want to set his velocity to just like go through the ground. So um, we should say, if. Uh, direction dot y is greater than 0. So if they're pressing up, then we do want to modify Mario such that his velocity up is, let's say, let's say it's 1. Otherwise, we just want Mario back. We just want him to stay like he is. Um, OK, so we can have him walk around. And then when I tell him to jump. 
uh, it breaks because you have to apply your functions. I joke about this, but you wouldn't believe how many times I forget this. OK, so now we have Mario. And when I jump, he goes away. OK, so it works. We're good. Um, but we're missing, we're missing gravity. Um, so one thing that was kind of surprising to me when I wrote this is that like, you need to simulate gravity to make Mario work. I don't know. It just seems more sophisticated than what I had in my mind of what Mario was like. In any case, gravity. So again, this is dependent on time. So we can say, I want a new Mario where his y velocity becomes uh, Mario dot, his, his current velocity minus some fraction of time, right? So as time passes, I want to take a bit away from his y velocity. So eventually it will become negative and he'll go towards the ground. So let's make this higher. Perfect, right? Gravity is working great, but uh, the world is broken, right? Like uh, there's a ground, and we forgot about that. So when we wrote our physics function, we just pretended that Mario just like can move through space however he wants. Oh, I just realized I can like, I can do that too. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is a trick to say. When we update his y position, take the maximum of 0 or his new position. So if he gets set to a negative number, we'll just say, OK, it's at 0. Um, so we kind of are doing a little hack in physics such that the ground exists. Um, OK, so now he can jump. He can actually jump whenever he wants, though. <laughs> let's get, his, let's get his, the gravity a little bit better here. Um, 100? In any case, we have a key. Pro ah, no, that sucks. <laughs> okay, much better. So the key problem here is like Goomba's coming along, and then you're just like, oh, oh, you were going to get me? And then you just jump over him for the entire level. <laughs> so again, this is not ideal. His speed is also. OK, we'll see. We'll see. Let's just fix this bug that lets him infinite jump. So we said if the person is pressing up, then we'll set his y velocity to be this particular value. What we really meant is if the person is pressing up and Mario happens to be on the ground, then we really want to move his velocity. Otherwise, we don't want to. So now when I press up, he just like will only be able to jump on the ground. So these contents are all messed up. OK, OK. Eh, eh, ah. OK, Moon Mario, perfect. So we've done quite a lot here. And let's just look at the code that we've written so far. So what we wrote is in this update section. And what's nice here is that it breaks up into nice composable pieces. You can think about gravity. You can think about physics. You can think about these different pieces and write them independently and work on them independently. And then compose them all together when you want to update your state. So it gives you this nice modular way of working with a, a chunk of state. Um, another nice thing is that we can just mess with the display now and sort of add additional features. So right now, Mario doesn't look so realistic. And like we know it's very important that Mario games look realistic. So like when he walks this way, like it doesn't really make any sense. So a uh, thing we can do is we have all this information about Mario. We know his, oh, how long do I have? You have five ah. more minutes and only one okay. question. OK, I'm going to skip this part entirely. It's so cool, jump, jump, jump. Um, so oh, no. OK, so the last part is how to integrate with JavaScript. And I've got a minute. Um, so this is a thing called the component model. So imagine you have 
three different parts of your application that you want to show on screen. Um, one is a search bar, one is like a way to like toggle things and filter, and the other one is the search results. And let's say you want to write this one piece in Elm. So the way you'd fit it into an existing application is called uh, ports. So we have an incoming port uh, from the world, and so people will be sending events to that. And in Elm, that's represented as a signal. So it's just this value that's changing over time. And on the other side, we have an outgoing port that says, hey, this stuff changed. Give it out to JavaScript. And there you can use callbacks and promises and whatever you want. Um, and then thread your application together in this way. So this means you can write a little bit of Elm code uh, where it's nice, where it suits your application, where it's helpful, and use the rest as JavaScript. Um, so one person who's done this uh, has been doing it to like model games. So I have an example of this. Uh, he was playing this game against his grandma, and apparently his grandma would always crush him. Um, so he was like, what is the strategy so I can beat my grandma at this game? Um, so he would do these simulations written in Elm to figure out, OK, if I play this strategy, like what are the dangerous parts? Where do I want to avoid on the board? Um, and so what he's doing here is embedding an Elm program in uh, some normal HTML website. So that's the whole thing. Oh, it got, oh, that's how far over I went? So that's, that's the end. That's functional reactive programming in Elm. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so we still have two minutes okay. to answer this question. Just a minute, please. So it was uh, that why is a new language needed and which feature or which features are not replaceable by CoffeeScript or JavaScript? Sure. So one big difference is that Elm is statically typed. So it's been a like decade, two decade long challenge to make JavaScript somewhat fast. Um, and there's still problems. And that sort of comes down to key language design choices that were made in JavaScript that, you, that force you to do extra checks and compile in the, when you're running the code. And those limitations don't exist in Elm. Um, another part is the benefits of, of reactive programming and static types and functional programming become much more uh, apparent in a language that's actually designed for those things. Um, but if you want to use CoffeeScript, it can integrate well with Elm. So, okay. Another question: uh, Does it support touch points? If yes, how many touch points simultaneously? Uh, so, so um, if I understand correctly, there is a touch library, and yeah. it, I, I've tr I have tried, but I ran out of fingers. I think browsers can do like twelve or some kind of weird number. Um, but it's just using the normal like browser API. So, uh, so yeah, there's actually a guy, there's this German guy who has a demo scene back, background. So he just makes crazy things that I didn't know were possible. And one of his examples was a, a, a touch uh, application where he was sort of moving a shape around in 3D, but like 3D wasn't implemented then. But in, in any case, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> So thank you very much. You perfectly executed your task and we fit to the schedule. Thanks again. <clears throat>